you know what is really interesting is uh, how do you communize the richest, most capitalist nation in the world? How do you communize such a country? Well, it's very easy. What you do is you take control of the education system and you dumb down the public to the point where they don't know the difference between capitalism and socialism. I'm sure if that if you went to the local mall and asked the average person, what is the difference between capitalism and socialism, they wouldn't know how to answer you. What's the difference between a socialist society and a, a, a constitutional republic? They wouldn't know how to answer you. You see, so we've been so thoroughly dumbed down. And the interesting thing is about all of this dumbing down is that the Russians know exactly what's happening to us. You see, because they went through it. But they had a violent revolution. They didn't have the kind of revolution that we're having, you see, because they were a backward country and they were poor, and so the Bolsheviks were able to take it over. But the Russians resisted. You know, millions were killed resisting communism. You know, James Madison, one of the wisest of our founding fathers and an author of our Constitution once said, quote, there are more instances of the abridgment of the freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. Bingo. And that's what's happened. Well, you know, back in 1934, when the National Socialists were consolidating their dictatorship in Germany, one of their disillusioned members, Hermann Roschning, quit the party and left Germany. He then wrote a book, The Revolution of Nihilism, A Warning to the West, predicting what was in store for the world under the Nazis. In that book, he described the techniques used by despots to seize total power. First, they had to be democratically elected, as Hitler was in 1933. Then they had to cripple their political opponents. Then they could freely impose brute force on everyone. And that's what happens, that's what's happened in Venezuela. Hugo Chavez was elected legally and then began crippling his political opponents. And you ask, can it happen here? Well, how did all of this uh, start? This radical change did not happen overnight. For socialists, it took the culmination, it was the culmination of a very slow, arduous process which they knew would take decades to achieve. And they never for a moment lost their desire or vision for that goal, even though socialism in practice has been responsible for some of the greatest crimes against human beings in all of human history. Millions have been murdered in the name of socialism, but even hindsight teaches socialists Nothing. They don't learn anything from history. Isn't that amazing? That you would have thought that by now there wouldn't be any socialists around. But there they are, as bloodthirsty as ever. How did all of this begin? You may be surprised, if not shocked, to learn that socialists began organizing their movement in this country as early as 1825 even before the word socialism was invented. It all began when a self-appointed messiah by the name of Robert Owen, an English manufacturer, came to America to set up the first secular communist colony in New Harmony, Indiana. See, it didn't happen in Russia first. It happened here first, New Harmony, Indiana. Wonderful place to visit, incidentally. He believed that the new young country of America was the perfect place in which to create a new collectivist social system for the human race. The key dogma in Owen's system was the notion that man's character 
had been deformed by religious brainwashing and that only rational education could correct it. Of course, the term brainwashing was not used in those days, but the idea was the same. <coughs> Owen's cure for all of society's ills was the reformation of mankind through a new kind of secular, scientifically oriented education. Thus, in founding New Harmony, education was to be of prime importance in creating socialist utopia. To that end, Owen assembled a distinguished group of scientists and educators ready and willing to put his ideas to the test. And incidentally, all of that history is in my book, Is Public Education Necessary? That education would be the heart of the communist experiment was made clear in the first issue of the New Harmony Gazette, which appeared on October 1st, 1825. It clearly stated that, quote, individuality detracts largely from the sum of human happiness. You see, that's the formula for collectivism. It, it, then, uh, uh, quote, it, it then elaborated, quote, it is intended to point out what we believe to be the most rational, therefore the, the best mode of educating human beings from infancy to manhood, knowing that any character from the best to the worst, from the most ignorant to the most enlightened, may be given to any individual, community, or to the world at large by different modes of education." Unquote. And from that time on, government-controlled education has always been the key to the creation of a perfect utopian society led by the socialist elite. When after two years, the Owenite experiment failed in New Harmony. The failure was blamed on the education the participants had had as children. They simply could not adapt themselves to a communist way of life. Thus, they believed that a socialist education must precede the creation of a socialist society, which is exactly what they've been doing to our children all these past five decades preparing them for socialism, softening them up for socialism. By the way, when the Bolsheviks took over Russia in 1917, they realized that the middle-class bourgeoisie could ne would never be able to adapt themselves to communism, and that is why millions of them were sent to the labor camps in Siberia or eliminated. Pol Pot did the same thing in Cambodia, just killing millions of individuals educated under the old system because they were unfit for the new communist utopia. And incidentally, they could spot anyone who had an education because they wore glasses. If you wore glasses, you were eliminated. Since the Owenites were atheists and very unpopular with the American people, they decided to go underground and promote the idea of a national government education system by organizing conspiratorial secret societies to do the promoting. One of the members of that conspiracy, Orestes Brownson, later converted to Catholicism and revealed the existence of the conspiracy. He wrote, quote, the great object was to get rid of Christianity and to convert our churches into halls of science. The plan was to establish a system of state, we said national schools, from which all religion was to be excluded, in which nothing was to be taught but such knowledge as is verifiable by the senses, and to which all parents were to be compelled by law to send their children. Of course, that's happened. You know, all religion has been taken out of the schools. The first thing to be done was to get this system of schools established. For this purpose, a secret society was formed, and the whole country was to be organized somewhat on the plan of the Carbonari of Italy. The Carbonari were the Illuminati organized in Italy. 
The organization was commenced in 1829 in the city of New York, and to my own knowledge was affected throughout a considerable part of New York State. How far it was extended in other states, or whether it is still kept up, I know not, for I abandoned it in the latter part of the year 1830, and have since had no confidential relations with any engaged in it. But this much I can say, the plan has been successfully pursued, the views we put forth have gained great popularity, and the whole action of the country on the subject has taken the direction we sought to give it." Unquote. So there you have it. Socialists or communists began undermining our free society, our free system as early as the 1830s. And so if you've wondered why Americans adopted government education so early in our history, and that's what I wanted to find out when I wrote the book, Is Public Education Necessary? There's the answer. All of this had to be done by stealth so that the American people would not recognize what the true aims of the system were, you see. But the most important fact we learned from this is that the socialists saw education as the only sure way to socialism. You see, you can't have socialism and uh, free education. They're incompatible. But if you have socialism, you've got a government control of the children. In that way, they could get around the obstacles our Constitution put in their way. However, the movement for government education did not start with the Owenites. It actually was first promoted by the Unitarians who had taken over Harvard University in 1805 and declared war against the Puritan, uh, the Puritan Calvinists. They became the new liberal elite, and their aim was to get the children out of Calvinist schools by creating a system of secular government schools. They took their model of government schooling from Prussia, which Horace Mann, secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education, had visited in 1843 and came back singing the praises of centralized government control of education. He wrote in his famous seventh annual report, quote, if Prussia can pervert the benign influences of education to the support of arbitrary power, we surely can employ them for the support and perpetuation of republican institutions. A national spirit of liberty can be cultivated more easily than a national spirit of bondage. And if it may be made one of the great prerogatives of education to perform the unnatural and unholy work of making slaves, then surely it must be one of the noblest instrumentalities for rearing a nation of free men." Unquote. Of course, the public schools I attended in the 1930s and 40s in New York City promoted patriotism and American principles of government. As a matter of fact, the principal used to read the 23rd Psalm at our, at our assemblies. That was in the 1930s. You, see, you couldn't possibly do that today. But soon these schools became the seminaries for the indoctrination of socialism by an educational elite known as the progressives. Indeed, it was the rise of the progressive movement toward the end of the 19th century that made it possible for Owen's dream of a socialist education system to be fulfilled. Now, who were the progressives? They were a new breed of Protestant academics who no longer believed in the religion of their fathers. They now put their faith in science, which explained the physical world, evolution, which explained the origin of living matter. You know, we all crawled out of the ooze, the primordial ooze and psychology, 
which explained human behavior and provided the scientific means to control it. They were also socialists. Why? Because they had to explain the origin and nature of evil. Evil was not caused by man's innate depravity, as preached by John Calvin or the doctrine of original sin. According to the progressives, evil was caused by ignorance, poverty, and social injustice. A good secular education would get rid of ignorance, which would in turn get rid of poverty, which would also get rid of social injustice. And the cause of all of these ills was capitalism, with its emphasis on private property, independent individualism, economic competition, and the accepted existence of both the rich and the poor. Under capitalism, you could get rich. Under socialism, equality of economic circumstance would wipe out the gulf between the rich and the poor. And so by getting rid of capitalism, they would get rid of the basic causes of evil. John Dewey was their philosophical leader. And in 1898, he wrote an article entitled The Primary School Fetish, in which he outlined the progressive plan for taking over the public schools and turning them into institutions of socialist indoctrination. He stressed the importance of shifting the emphasis in primary education away from reading and literacy to socialization. He wrote, quote, there is a false educational god whose idolaters are legion and whose cult influences the entire educational system. This is language study, the study not of foreign language, but of English, not in higher, but in primary education. It does not follow, however, that because this course was once wise, it is so any longer. My proposition is that Conditions, social, industrial, and intellectual, have undergone such a radical change that the time has come for a thoroughgoing examination of the emphasis put upon linguistic work in elementary instruction. The plea for the predominance of learning to read in early school life because of the great importance attaching to literature seems to me a perversion. How do you like that? A perversion. Teaching children to read at an early age is a perversion." Unquote. And because his views would be considered so radical by parents and teachers, he wrote, quote, change must come gradually. To force it unduly would compromise its final success by favoring a violent reaction. So if all of these plans were so good, why would they favor a violent reaction? Why would people object? He goes on, he says, what is needed in the first place is that there should be a full and frank statement of conviction with regard to the, the matter from psychologists and physiologists and from those school administrators who are conscious of the evils of the present regime." Unquote. In other words, deceiving parents would become an important and implicit part of the plan for radical reform. And psychologists, of whom Dewey was one, would play an important part in creating this elaborate deception. Dewey then wrote, quote, there are already in existence a considerable number of educational experiment stations which represent the outposts of educational progress. If these schools can be adequately supported for a number of years, they will perform a great vicarious service, unquote. Indeed, Dewey himself conducted such an experimental school at the University of Chicago and the book he wrote about that experience, The School and Society, became the Bible of progressive education and the basis 
of 20th century school reform. Incidentally, one of the new experimental schools that used the new progressive curriculum was the Lincoln School at Teachers College at Columbia University. John D. Rockefeller Jr. endowed the school with $3 million and sent three of his five sons to be educated there. The result is that Nelson, Lawrence, and Winthrop all became dyslexic, which they complained about later in life. <laughs> Nelson used to say, I can't read, so he would speak extemporaneously. You know, he couldn't even read his own speeches. And of course, he hired uh, Henry Kissinger to do his reading for him. And Winthrop, of course, was thrown out of Yale. He did so poorly, but he went on to become the governor of Arkansas. <laughs> By the way, Dewey did not get his socialism from Karl Marx. He got it from an American by the name of Edward Bellamy, who wrote a novel about America evolving into a socialist state by the year 2000. The aim of Bellamy's socialism was equality. And since everyone would be equal in economic circumstances, envy, competition, and crime would disappear. In order to implement John Dewey's progressive program in the public schools, the progressives had to get the support of the teachers. And they did this by gaining control of the National Education Association around World War I. After the war, the NEA began a long-range campaign to get federal aid for the public schools. Not an easy task. From 1867 to 1940, a period of 73 years, the Congress passed about 11 minor pieces of legislation related to education. The fear of federal control of schools kept most legislators from voting for federal aid to public education. But resistance was gradually broken down by such acts as the National School Lunch Act of 1946 and the School Milk Program Act of 1954. Who could possibly be against lunch and milk for children? <laughs> See how they work? They know how to pull on the heartstrings of the people. But it was the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, passed during the Johnson administration, which opened the floodgates of the U.S. Treasury for the benefit of the progressive establishment. From 1965 to 1983, a period of only 18 years, there were 43 education acts passed by Congress including the establishment in 1979 of a U.S. Department of Education with cabinet status. And we've got to get rid of that department, you know. Reagan tried to get rid of it, but he was sabotaged by the rhinos in his own government, you see. In the year 1994 alone, there were about 180 educational restructuring bills before Congress. The three most important bills enacted were Goals 2000 Act, the School to Work Opportunities Act, and the Improving America's Schools Act, a reauthorization of the ESEA of 1965. Title I of that law was supposed to help the poor and culturally deprived kids learn to read. 45 years and over $150 billion later, the kids are doing worse today than in 1965. All that money spent for what? Spent just to, to finance the, all of these teachers, you know, all of these so-called Title I teachers. You see, every school district has Title I teachers, a Title I director, a Title I assistant director, a Title I assistant, assistant director, you know, and they're all on the payroll. That's where the money goes. Then the kids are not learning to read. Today, it's called the No Child Left Behind Act. 
and it was passed by a bipartisan Kennedy Bush love fest. You remember that? Where they were hugging each other? Oh, it's all for the children. <laughs> the progressives were also behavioral psychologists who consider children to be little animals who can be trained like animals. See, it's true, animals can be trained, but they can't be educated. True, human beings can also be trained, but human beings can be educated, you see. The most outspoken of the behaviorists was John B. Watson, who wrote in 1924 in his book Behaviorism, quote, Human beings do not want to class themselves with other animals. They are willing to admit that they are animals, but something else in addition. It is this something else that causes the trouble. In this something, something else is bound up everything that is classed as religion, the life hereafter, morals, love of children, parents, country, and the like. The raw fact that you, as a psychologist, if you are to remain scientific, must describe the behavior of man in no other terms than those you would use describing the behavior of the ox you slaughter. And this drove and still drives many timid souls away from behaviorism. In other words, behavioral psychology was not a career for the timid. And that is why today's behavioral psychologists will stick it to the parents. He further wrote, quote, the interest of the behaviorist in man's doings is more, more than the interest of the spectator. He wants to control man's reactions as physical scientists want to control and manipulate other natural phenomena. It is the business of behavioristic psychology to be able to predict and control human activity. I suppose if, if uh, John Watson was alive today, he would go nuts at a, at a uh, tea party convention. He said, we can't control these people. There's something wrong. It just doesn't work. But even as Dewey had cautioned that change must come slowly, it didn't take long before an increasing number of discerning parents began to realize what was happening. Their children were being taught to read by the new whole word method, better known as the Dick and Jane method, that taught children to read English as if it were Chinese, an ideographic writing system. By 1955, the reading situation had become so bad that Dr. Rudolf Flesch was compelled to write his great eye-opener, Why Johnny Can't Read. You realize that was written 1955, he told us why. He said, quote, the teaching of reading all over the United States, in all the schools, in all the textbooks, is totally wrong and flies in the face of all logic and common sense. Today, the phonetic system of teaching reading is kept out of our schools as effectively as if we had a dictatorship with an all-powerful ministry of education." Unquote. He then explained that when you impose an ideographic teaching method on an alphabetic reading system, you get dyslexia and reading disability. And that's what the schools specialize in doing. They create dyslexia and reading disabilities. Now, many of you were taught to read by that method. Do you remember those great literary gems as Dick, look Jane, look, look, see Dick, see, see, oh, see, see Dick, oh, see Dick, oh, 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 funny, funny Dick. Most of you thought that was nuts, right? You said, this is crazy. You wondered what the heck is going on in this school. You know, nobody talks this way. You know, uh, the kids were smarter than the teachers, but they couldn't say anything because what did mother say? Don't you know, obey your teacher. You see, 
And so the kids just repeated the, you know, repeated all of this in, insane stuff. Of course, that kind of inane repetition does not teach a child to read. It is based on the behaviorist animal conditioning techniques perfected in this country by Edward L. Thorndike at Columbia University and in the Soviet Union by Professor Pavlov. Pavlov, indeed, when this new method was in, uh, pa uh, Pavlov, right. Indeed, when this new method was introduced, a well-known neurophysiologist by the name of Samuel T. Orton wrote an article in the February 1929 Journal of Educational Psychology warning the educators that this new teaching method would produce reading disability. He warned them. But apparently, that is what the educators wanted, and they got it. You see, it is very easy to turn a child into a dyslexic. All you have to do is have the child memorize a sight vocabulary. That is a list of words, which is what teachers do every day in our elementary schools. Once the child has memorized several hundred words, that child will automatically develop a whole word reflex and look at all printed words as little pictures. And if you look at a word as a picture, you won't necessarily look at it from left to right or right to left. You will look for something in that word that will remind you of what it says. It's very easy to spot a sight reader. When they read aloud, they leave out words that are there. They put in words that aren't there. They read words backwards. They misread words. They confuse B's and D's. And they stop cold when encountering a word they've never seen before. Incidentally, the old Dick and Jane method has evolved into something called whole language, in which they mix some phonics with whole word memorization. It is called a balanced approach. But that balanced approach is deceptive in that it does not teach intensive systematic phonics. It merely gives the child some phonetic clues which he must think about if he wants to use them. What can parents do to prevent their children from becoming victims of this great teaching fraud? The best solution is to teach your child to read at home. True, some children do learn to read in school because for some reason or other they're able to figure out the system. And some of them have uh, photographic memories. But many children, of course, can't, as we all know. If you're curious about the philosophy behind whole language, here's a description of it given in a book entitled Whole Language, What's the Difference, written by three whole language professors in 1991. We read on page 19, quote, from a whole language perspective, reading and language use in general is a process of generating hypotheses in a meaning-making transaction in a socio-historical context. I'm sure you all got that, right? <laughs> As a transactional process, Reading is not a matter of getting the meaning from the text, as if that meaning were in the text waiting to be decoded by the reader. Rather, reading is a matter of readers using the cues print provides and the knowledge they bring with them of language subsystems of the world to construct a unique interpretation. Moreover, that interpretation is situated. Readers' creations not retrievals of meaning with text, vary depending on their purpose of reading and the expectations of others in the reading event. This view of reading implies there is no single correct meaning for a given text, only plausible meanings, you see, unquote. So of course when we read, you know, um, C. Dick, you know, O, 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 funny, funny Dick, you don't know what it means, you know. It could mean something else. <laughs> and if that doesn't convince you that these professors are nuts, 
read what they say on page 32. Quote, whole language represents a major shift in thinking about the reading process. Rather than viewing meaning as getting the words, whole language educators view reading as essentially a process of creating meanings. See, it doesn't matter what the author has written. You can create your own meaning, you see. Meaning is created through a transaction with whole meaningful texts, texts of any length that were written with the intent <coughs> to communicate reading. It is a transaction, not an extraction of meaning from the print, in the sense that the reader created meanings are a fusion of what the reader brings and what the text offers. Although students who learn to read in whole language classrooms are like all proficient readers, eventually able to read or identify a large inventory of words, learning words is certainly not the goal of whole language. Would you ever, in, unquote, would you ever trust a whole language reader to read a contract? No. <laughs> you know, if they're going to interpret it, how is that going to stand up in court? You know? Oh, well, I thought the contract said this, because that's my interpretation, you see. And I'm a whole language reader. Now, you might think that all of this pedagogical insanity is taking place in some kind of political vacuum. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Whole language practice is very politically oriented. We read on page 23, quote, learning is a social process. Although whole language educators accept the importance of learning through individual interactions with the environment, they learn more heavily, they lean more heavily on Vygotsky's ideas about the social nature of learning. Whole language takes seriously Vygotsky's notion of the zone of proximal development, which entails stressing the importance of collaborations between students and teachers and between peers through which students can transcend their own individual limitations." Unquote. Well, you might ask, who is Vygotsky? Well, Lev Vygotsky was a Soviet psychologist who worked with Pavlov's colleagues in the State Institute of Experimental Psychology in Moscow in the 1920s and 30s. John Wirtz, Vygotsky's biographer writes, quote, it is important to note that Vygotsky was a staunch advocate of dialectical and historical materialism. He was one of the creators of Marxist psychology. People such as Vygotsky and his followers devoted every hour of their lives to making certain that the new socialist state the first grand experiment based on Marxist-Leninist principles would survive." Unquote. Vygotsky's colleague Alexander Luria wrote, quote, Vygotsky was the leading Marxist theoretician among us in his hands. Marx's methods of analysis did serve a vital role in shaping our course, unquote. So there you have it, you know, the educators are actually using the psychology of a communist, Marxist, in their course and reading. That's why, that's why whole language is so important to them. Apparently, these same methods of analysis are also serving to shape the course of the whole language agenda. The three professors just cited uh, uh, state on page 67, quote, the whole language theoretical premise underlying which topics are pursued and how they are treated is, quote, all knowledge is socially constructed. Therefore, all knowing is, pol is political. In an effort to promote critical literacy, thus to help children learn to read the world, not only the word, teachers who work with theme cycles try, no matter whether the topic is overtly political or not, to show how the topic is related to 
other more general questions. They try to demystify social institutions by helping children investigate connections between surface facts and underlying social structures, between lived experience and structural features of class, gender, and race. They know that not making connections is as political as making connections, unquote. So you can see how thoroughly political this whole business is, how they've used the teaching of reading as a means of creating little socialists. Very clever, you know. And they get away with it. Because who reads these books? Other educators. You see, you're probably the first general audience to hear what they actually say in these books, you see. Because people like me are willing to read these boring books <laughs> to bring all this information to you. <laughs> In other words, whole language also entails political indoctrination. But what about phonics, you might ask? We get a very good idea of what whole language indoctrinators think of phonics in a book entitled Evaluation, Whole Language, Whole Child. We read on page 19, quote, the way you interpret what the child does will reflect what you understand reading to be. For instance, if she reads the word feather for father, a phonics-oriented teacher might be pleased because she's come close to sounding the word out. However, if you believe reading is a meaning-making, meaning-seeking process, you may be concerned that she's overly dependent on phonics at the expense of meaning. You'd be happier with a miscue such as daddy, even though it doesn't look or sound anything like the word in the text. At least the meaning would be intact." Unquote. My response to that kind of imbecilic pedagogy is that any child who looks at the word father and says daddy can't read. <laughs> it's as simple as that. But tell that to a whole language teacher. Meanwhile, we the taxpayers are paying for all of it. But it is now time for us to deal with the thorny issue of government education. Parents, voters, property owners, and teachers must realize that the most important institution in a socialist state is a government-owned and controlled school system wherein children, wherein children can be indoctrinated to accept a socialist way of life. The best way to end this subversive process is to return to the concept of educational freedom in which the federal government has no role in education and state governments can begin thinking the unthinkable, privatizing the schools. <laughs> Believe it or not, yeah. <laughs> See, we've got to get government out of education. Government does not belong there. It's a parental uh, responsibility. Yes, sir. And it's, and it's, it's the prerogative of private organizations and private schools to teach our children to read. That's the way it was before we, you know, before we had these government schools. Believe it or not, local public schools can easily become private institutions governed by local trustees and supported by tuition fees. This would greatly reduce the tax burden on homeowners and provide more than enough resources to pay for the tuitions of poor families. The cost of education would decrease dramatically since education would once more become reality-oriented, wherein the fundamental academic subjects would be taught without the added costs of progressive educational malpractice. Individual intelligence and literacy would be enhanced, while collectivist groupthink would be gotten rid of. But most compelling of all, the drive towards socialism would be stopped, for you cannot have socialism without government-controlled education. Listen to what liberal professor Anthony G. Ottinger of Harvard University, a member of the CFR, by the way, 
told an audience of communications executives in 1982 about the future of education. Quote, the present traditional concept of literacy has to do with the ability to read and write. But the real question that confronts us today is how do we help citizens function well in their society? How can they acquire the skills necessary to solve their problems? Do we, for example, really want to teach people to do a lot of sums or write in a fine round hand when they have a five dollar handheld calculator or a word processor to work with? Or do we really have to have everybody literate? Writing and reading in the traditional sense when we have the means through our technology to achieve a new flowering of oral communication. And you know what that is, that's rap, oral communication. <laughs> he goes on, what is speech recognition and speech synthesis all about if it does not lead to ways of reducing the burden on the individual of the imposed notions of literacy that were a product of 19th century economics and technology. It is the traditional idea that says certain forms of communication, such as comic books, are bad. But in the modern context of functionalism, they may not be all that bad." Unquote. I doubt that there are many parents in America who send their children to school to learn to read comic books. If anything, they want their children to be taught to read and write in the traditional manner. They don't consider learning to read as a burden imposed on the individual. Rather, if taught properly, learning to read can be a joyful experience for children eager to explore the wonderful world of the written word as we all not so long ago witnessed in the amazing popularity of the Harry Potter books. Remember that? All these kids suddenly, and incidentally, those Harry Potter books were not small books. They were 600 pages, 700 pages, and the kids ate them up. So, and they enjoyed them. Widespread literacy, by the way, is not the product of the 19th, of 19th century forces. It was the product of the 16th century Reformation in which the need to be able to read the Bible became the imperative for universal literacy. In a Christian civilization, everybody has to be literate. But of course, Professor Ottinger thinks differently. He believes that literacy is only for the ruling cognitive elite. Yet, we have compulsory school attendance for everyone, which Professor Ottinger does not want to abolish. Yes, he wants all of your children in the government schools, but he and his colleagues will decide who will become literate and who will not. See, what an what a evil system that they are proposing. See how their minds work to, to deliberately create illiterate children that they can control. But the millions of parents who send their children to the government schools soon discover that their child is learning disabled or dyslexic because of the teaching methods used in the schools. And because many of the children who cannot learn to read become frustrated and angry and act out in the classroom, the edu educators offer a cure, Ritalin, and other mind-altering drugs. Even some liberals are concerned about the decline of literacy in America. In 2007, the National Endowment for the Arts issued an alarming survey, Reading at Risk. The endowment chairman, Dana Joya, stated, quote, this is a massive social problem. We are losing the majority of the new generation. They will not achieve anything close to their potential because of poor reading, unquote. But of course, he did not offer the simplest solution, teach the kids to read with intensive systematic phonics. See, we're not looking for a cure for cancer. We know how to teach reading. It was done when I was going to school. It was done, you know, in the early days of this country. But they're not going to go back to that because the socialists control the system 
and they want to continue to dumb down everyone. According to this report, the number of 17-year-olds who never re read for pleasure increased from 9% in 1984 to 19% in 2004. Almost half of Americans between the ages of 18 and 24 never read books for pleasure. Why? Because reading has become a painful, tortuous exercise that they wish to avoid. The simple truth is that literacy is not at all difficult to achieve, provided the right teaching methods are used. Indeed, the homeschool uh, movement has already proven that parents can actually do a better job of teaching reading than our high-priced professionals. <laughs> it has also been shown that children, that children progress better academically when taught at home and that the cost of educating a child at home is less than a thousand dollars a year. And how much are we spending on the kids in the public schools? You know, incredible amount of money. We spend more money on education than in the history of the world and, we're, and, and, the, and the results are the worst that we've ever had. The plain unvarnished reality is that the public schools have become a criminal, a criminal enterprise. Hear that? Our public schools have become a criminal enterprise. Our educational leaders are engaged in a deliberate, well-planned conspiracy to dumb down the American people. Isn't that a crime? Indeed, back in 1983, the National Commission on, on Excellence in Education reported, quote, if an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. As it stands, we have allowed this to happen to ourselves, unquote. Why aren't our educational leaders being held responsible for this act of war against our people? Should not the deliberate dumbing down of an entire nation be considered a crime of gigantic proportions? What about the deliberate use of teaching methods that cripple the brains of our children? Is that not also a crime? Medical malpractice is a punishable offense, but educational malpractice is not. And the educators manage to extort more and more money from a gullible public to keep doing what they've been doing for decades. Is not extortion a crime? See, that's what they do. They extort money from us. Our educators have also become drug pushers. Drug pushers are supposed to be criminals, right? forcing six million children to take mind-altering drugs so that they won't be able to resist the harm being done to them in the classroom. Is turning a normal child into a drug addict not a crime? What about exposing children to virtual pornographic sex education in which they are taught that perversion is perfectly normal? Is that not a kind of child molestation that should be labeled a crime? Sex education has become a battering ram against a child's religious morality. As a result, millions of children are condemned to lives as functional illiterates, mentally stunted, spiritually empty, and morally vulnerable. Nor do we know how many children have been led to suicide by satanic death education, which has been marbleized into the curriculum. Writing one's obituary, visits to funeral parlors and cemeteries are part of the death education program. Our government schools now produce ignorance, illiteracy, moral depravity, assaults, and massacres. There were no massacres when I was going to school. We loved our teachers because our teachers were doing good. They were helping us learn. They didn't interfere with our religious beliefs. They didn't want us to become atheists. And so we loved them. 
And the schools were immaculate, and nobody burned them down, and there was no vandalism. But today we've got massacres in the schools. Can you imagine? So, school, so the children are in danger physically in the schools. You've got shootings, assaults, massacres. And most American parents still send their children to these institutions because they are free and have a great football team. <laughs> but what a price many of their children will pay for the rest of their lives. I could go on, but I know you get the message. We are where we are today because we let our guard down. As a result, we are now in a fight for our lives, our freedoms, and the future of our children. The Founding Fathers dedicated their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to achieve the freedom they gave us. Can we do any less? Thank you very much.